The last three talks were a fantastic introduction to what I'm going to tell you about. And one of my bottom line um, sort of take homes, I guess, although I'm going to take show you a take home message in a second, is that you should all be uh, like that famous protagonist in Network, that you should be mad as hell and not willing to take it anymore. There is a fundamental change that has happened in the last 30 years from when I trained as a neurologist. Um, I saw patients uh, who I couldn't do anything for. You know, 90 percent of the patients I couldn't do anything for. And there was some um, sort of psychological peace with that because um, we didn't have the knowledge or the ability to, to, to change that. And uh, I, what drove me back into the lab was that I wanted to try to change that uh, so that we did have a capacity to change it. But, but I think what's happened in the last 30 years is that, is that we do have the capacity to make that difference. And, and I think this is a fundamental change. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a result of, in my view, among other things, the, um, the, uh, the success of the, uh, of the covenant that NIH made with the public 50, 60 years ago, that if you fund us to understand uh, the basis of biology and human disease, uh, that will provide a way to improve human health. And um, back when I was training, uh, we didn't have that capacity, but, but we do have it now. And so as you heard with these horror stories that, that Emil just told you, that, that I mean, I've been through the same things. I was just laughing through my, under my breath. Under, you know, in most of his talk, because I love, you know, misery loves company. So I, 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 I but this is real. And, and for those of us who, who do this work, it's frustrating. But just imagine, and this is how I tell everybody at my center to think, imagine you are a person with a rare disease or any untreatable disease, or you're a parent. How would you want us to act as researchers? Would you want us to act like that, what, what, what Emil just described? That, that's voluntary. That's self-inflicted. So, so what I would argue with you, and I'm just going to give you some sense of what we're doing here, is that we're, we're just starting, but that we, we can't solve this 21st century problem with 20, 20th century approaches. And, 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 and we have an opportunity here. We have an obligation, which I feel very, very strongly, um, to the patients that, that we all see. So, um, so let's, get, let's get started. So, Okay, so here's the take-home messages. You know, I, I, when I got trained, you know, probably as many of you do, you know, you always train your folks to, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I mean, here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, the first thing is that translation is a team sport. Um, uh, if anybody tells you that team science diminishes the value of individual contributions, tell them they're full of it. I always tell them LeBron James is not a bad basketball player because he plays on a team. Give me a break. Uh, it just requires a, a different dynamic. Uh, individually expert members, but they know how to play on a team. And uh, current operational structures, incentive structures, largely mitigate against that in the academic world. Translational failure uh, is 50% scientific. The process, is, as you've probably gathered from a lot of the talks uh, today, is, is, is a remarkably empirical process and uh, at every step of it. And, and that, in my view, is the fundamental problem, that whenever you have a process which has so many degrees of freedom, and, and you have so many steps that, that, have to go, that you have to go through, if you have a trial and error process, for the most part, you will get error, not success, when you have trials. And you multiply a very small success rate due to this empiricism times the many steps that, that, that are required. It's not surprising we have a 99.9% .9 failure rate, which we do. And uh, but so the scientific problems, but they're not all scientific problems. I mean, what Emil just talked about, I mean, he mentioned some science in there, but but most of what he was talking about was were, were, were operational issues. They weren't strictly scientific issues. Maybe they're social scientific issues, but they're not. They're not. They're they're, they're incentive issues. They're collaboration issues. They're 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 uh, 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 other kinds of operational issues. So NCATS works on both, because it's very clear we could get all the science great, fantastic done tomorrow, we'd still fail. Because, because of these operational problems. 
the, the opportunities are, are huge and systematic, so I think they require systematic solutions. One of the things that uh, you saw go by probably fairly quickly in um, Amos' slides, something that I talk about all the time, um, is that there are, in fact, as one of his slides uh, showed, uh, uh, approximately 7,000 rare diseases. Nobody knows exactly how many um, for a variety of reasons, but what we do know is that uh, orphan desig uh, approved orphan uh, uh, designated drugs at FDA is about 400 drugs for about 250 conditions. So, 7,000 minus 250 is 7,550. Therefore, if you are a parent of one of those people, one of those kids with one of those 6,750 drugs, you see a doctor like I used to be. You know, bad luck. You know, darn, I'm really sorry for you. you know, and you, any clinicians in the room, we've all given this speech. Um, and, and I think what you heard Emil say is it doesn't have to be this way. But it is. So it's an act of will. I think that's one of the things I want to take you. <laughs> so what is NCATS doing in this place? So, so we are a catalyst. We have to be a catalyst for a variety of reasons. Um, th there's a lot of great stuff going on. But, but like in a biochemical reaction, uh, what does a catalyst do? It brings together reactants that are inert by themselves, lowers the activation energy, and makes them produce something they otherwise wouldn't produce. So that's what NCATS does. We have to be a catalyst for a very simple reason. We're 1.8% of the NIH budget. So that means we have to be present in very small amounts, like a good catalyst, and, uh, but we also hope that we're going to make these processes much more uh, productive. Uh, we're also a convener, and you, we think of ourselves as an adapter between uh, typical uh, uh, academic fundamental research and commercialization, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, we're certainly an innovator. Uh, we occupy the tragedy of the commons. You know, there's lots of problems that we work in, if you know that term. These are terms that, these are problems mainly in uh, economics, where this came from, uh, problems which are everybody's problems. Problem, but nobody's problem in particular, so nobody solves it. And and uh, and particularly at an NIH, where we have 27 institutes, you know, we have a we have a nose institute, an eye institute, and a bone institute, and a heart institute, and a cancer institute. I, I never ceases to to uh, uh, I never never cease to um, uh, uh, take joy from. Um, uh, um, teasing Tom Insel and, uh, and Story Landis as a neurologist and somebody trained in psychiatry as well, that in 2013, we still have a mind institute and a brain institute. <laughs> Hello, you know, I think it's, it's been a few years, I think, uh, since we figured out that actually the mind is in the brain, not in the gallbladder, right? And so, but we said, there we are. And this has really important implications because if you tell people that they have to parcelate their knowledge in order to get tenure and therefore pay their bills, they will act as if the knee bone is not connected to the leg bone and will not make connections that biology is, 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 is staring us in the face with. We also occupy venture space. So <laughs> NIH, uh, as you m may have heard, uh, uh, is, is a tad conservative uh, at times. And, and peer review is, and we're all, we all do peer review. I don't, I don't anymore, I can't. But, uh, 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 and, uh, but it's also, it's, it's conservative on a scientific level, it's conservative on a policy level. And so what we're, we've sort of uh, 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 carved out a, 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 um, a role for ourselves as being uh, different. Uh, and, 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 and the reason that, uh, and different on purpose, um, because every step of the translational process uh, does not work well. And so what I uh, tell my folks is that, that as opposed to uh, approaching a problem and trying to solve it w the way it's always been solved, if the data tell you that you, that you are going to fail the vast majority of time, that's what the data tells us in translational space, our default ought to be when we're faced with a new problem, to do it differently. Otherwise, we're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? So the default is do it differently, not the same way, which when you, when you do that, it, it, you turn your head upside down uh, about how you think about problems. It fundamentally changes the way the NCATS people think about problems. Okay, so uh, we also have core values of, uh, among other things, collaboration. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Everything we do is a collaboration, everything. Uh, and demonstrably useful deliverables. Deliverables that are useful not only to the person who's doing the experiment in that they got a paper published which allows them uh, to get promoted, et cetera. I'm not dissing that, it's important. Um, but what's, that is a, I would argue that that's a means to an end. And, 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 and we have to have deliverables that are not only useful to that person, uh, but, but to uh, a collaborator. And, and ultimately a patient. Uh, and they have to be demonstrably useful, not, not, oh, we think in five years this will result in something. Demonstrably useful. 
Okay. So uh, I, I probably don't. I always show this because I have to convince people, you know, that we have a problem here. Because mainly, amazingly, some people haven't gotten the memo yet. But you've been you've been you're hearing this all morning. But I'll just put a particular spin on it. So, as Harry uh, uh, said, um, I, I actually, uh, when, uh, when I went from neurology and medicine, I went all the way back to the beginning to model organism genetics, and then worked my way up through genetics, genomics, and then all the drug stuff, and, and then eventually I made it back to patients again. But, but as a result of that, it's really evident to me that we really live in a, ver in a bittersweet time, a really paradoxical time, because on the one hand, exemplified by the Genome Project, we know more about ourselves in health and disease than we ever have, by orders of magnitude. However, we are very bad at, at, at making a difference in people's lives as a result of this. And if you're, if you're not, uh, you know, in Washington, you know, we, we have the Washington Post to get depressed every day, but up here you may not get that. Uh, so if you want to be depressed, uh, you, you should read this. This is an IOM report that came out in January, pithily titled, Shorter Lives, Poorer Health. And it goes on in, in, in exhaustive detail, relentless detail for hundreds of pages about how poor the Amer healthy American people is for voluntary reasons, the solvable reasons. And, 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 and then there's a very poor transition, as we know, from basic, basic observations or clinical observations, but they're anecdotal observations. Hmm, I wonder if that means that this would work. Well, going from, hmm, idea, as, as Emil had in his original slide, to actually something that you had demonstrated tangibly improves human health, big problem. Um, so we're not good at that. As a result, you know, of course, you've all followed the, the gradual dissolution of the drug and device and diagnostic development system in this country. And my old company, Merck, just laid off another 8,500 people last week, including some of the people who had gone through all the other purges, uh, people who have been at that company for 30 years uh, that, that just got laid off, fantastically talented people who are now gone. Um, uh, Clinical trial system in this country is uh, is a mess. Uh, I, uh, I I will quote um, uh, uh, Rob Califf here, who some of you know is a Duke and a fairly colorful uh, member of the translational community. I was on a panel with him a little while ago, and somebody suggested that this this is all this isn't this is a false problem. You know, it's really not a problem. It's all there. And he said, in his typical North Carolina drawl. Let me just be clear here. We are piss poor at translation. And <laughs> I said, damn, I'm glad you said that. But, which is a little more colorful than my language, but, um, uh, but, but it's absolutely true. It's very clear that if we had interventions tomorrow for every one of those 6,750 diseases that have no treatment, we would not have a clinical system to be able to test them. And even, as, as our Commissioner's Health was telling us, even when we demonstrate that interventions are useful, it takes a very long time to actually get them to all the patients who need them. That's that 17-year number. It's actually from cardiovascular. It's from uh, uh, post aspirin post-MI, ACE inhibitors after heart failure. It's very clear. And you can actually, you can actually, and people have done this, you can actually quantify the number of people who died as a result of those interventions not getting to all the patients who need them and improving public health. So what's the result of this? Well, people are not only un un unhealthier than they should be, but this is a big deal, and this is the world where I live in. Unfortunately, and as a now as a uh, center institute director, you know, I spend a lot of my time uh, uh, on this problem in Congress. That is, that that funders are really get impatient with us, or have lost in pa lost patience with us, and and you see this in the private sector or in, in public capital, uh, uh, private capital, sorry, uh, fleeing away from uh, um, uh, from uh, um, uh, medical. Uh, 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 development. Uh, there was actually a really interesting article, I think it was on Monday, on Monday or Tuesday in the second um, uh, section of the Wall Street Journal about this, showing that over the last five years or something, the, uh, the, the investment uh, uh, in, uh, in a VC in, in, in software companies has gone up 75 percent. In biotech, it's gone down about 25 percent. Devices has gone down 40 percent. And so we got a real problem here, and the, and the, and the problem is, uh, you know, those are all the investors who are, uh, a lot of them are managing your retirement funds and my retirement funds, and so they're trying to make a return on investment. With the kind of knuckleheaded system that we have, which is both empirical on the one hand and absolutely Kafkaesque on the other, as you just heard, if you were an investor, would you invest in that? But, but it's a solvable problem, and, and, and that's, that's what NCAS is trying to do. Okay. Oh, and I should just say, on the other hand, uh, Congress has also lost patience with us, I must, I must tell you. So when I got to NIH in 2002, we were 
uh, still viewed as Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. So I would go down there and, and people would, would always like to see me and, oh gosh, you're doing such good work. And now I go down there and they say, you know, why do you guys spend so darn much money? You know, that doubling thing, you know, I mean, don't you have enough money with that doubling? You know, which ended, what, 12 years ago, right? And, but, and the, the attitude now is that, that NIH is just one other constituency. You know, we're like the plumbers union, you know, we're, we're no different. And, and that is something that we lost as a community. I mean, some of it is shifts in political uh, leanings, as you know, but, but, but this can be recaptured, um, um, but we have to do it together. Okay, so in the middle of all this maelstrom uh, uh, comes NCAT. So what is the purpose of NCATs? And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because you can read it. I just want to uh, uh, emphasize a couple of words. So Catalyze already went through that. Uh, innovative methods and technologies. So we're all about um, uh, new ways of doing things that will lift all boats, uh, enhance the development, testing, and limitation. This is the, the official uh, mission, but I'll get to a small change in a second. Diagnostics and therapeutics across a wide range of human disease and conditions, meaning that we're disease agnostic. Uh, we, we don't work on particular diseases. Uh, this was uh, the, uh, the, the mission statement that was handed to me as director when I took over about 14 months ago. Um, and uh, uh, it will not surprise you from the last uh, talk about the FDA that changing the mission statement of one small division, of one small operational division, of one government department, of one branch of government actually requires the White House and the Congress to approve. So I cannot change that mission statement without going through those. I mean, how unbelievably stupid is that? So uh, I'm doing this in, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, nonviolent resistance, um, uh, an informal but important modification, enhance the development, testing, and implementation of interventions that tangibly improve human health. So there are lots of interventions, like behavioral interventions, devices, other things that are not included on in the previous uh, uh, um, uh, uh, definition. And, and it's not just a good enough that you have to implement them, these interventions. You have to have to show they do something. And, you know, that's a really, and that's a science in its own right, as we've been hearing. Okay, so um, I love this slide. Some of you have seen me show this before. I keep showing it because I love it so much. This is a slide made by Francis Collins' office uh, showing an org chart of NIH. Right, so, so this, and, uh, you know, you can't make this stuff up, right? Because building one made this. And, 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 and so these are all the billiard balls, the 27 institutes of NIH. Um, and, and here's in the middle, here's NCATS here, a uh, 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 horse of a different color, supposed to be in the middle. And, and, and I always like to think about this as sort of a, an aerial view of the silos that make up NIH. Uh, and here's NCATS sitting in the middle of the cornfield here. But the important thing about NCATS is supposed to be not only a horse of a different color here, but it's supposed to be kind of a Grand Central Station. It's supposed to be a, 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 an Adapt, a, a convener, a, a collaborator, which is which is really different, and we really do operate differently. Most institutes are very inward looking. We are very outward looking. We don't think about what is what is different about a disease. We think about what is common to diseases in the translational process, because we think that that is the way to make really fundamental change. So, uh, because of where NCATS uh, uh, the, the position in the, in the ecosystem that it occupies, and, and some of the challenges that you've been hearing about from the previous three speakers, um, we need to occupy a, a, a place collaboratively, which is a bit different from our sister institutes. Uh, so we have much closer connections on a, on a really routine uh, basis uh, with, with disease advocacy groups, nonprofits, the FDA, and EMA, and other places, pharma, biotech, VC, et cetera, uh, as well as our traditional partners here in academia. <laughs> Um, so, so let me just make a sociological point here, um, which, uh, which I, I hope will, um, I don't know, well, the Jets won last week, right? But the Giants, the Giants, That's Giants finally won a game. That's football. That's football. Yeah. Football. Yeah. yeah right. Oh, they had, okay, well, okay, so I'm going to use a football analogy, so, you know, so, so bear with me here. Okay, so, uh, and this is really important for academic institutions uh, for, to be successful here, any institution, but particularly academic institutions. Okay, so uh, requires top performers with a wide variety of different disciplines to work together to a common goal and get credit. Ah, uh, that's the one. There's the rub. Okay, so traditional science is this. This is the model that I grew up with. So who's this? Very good. God, there's almost, who said that? <laughs> Unbelievable. Somebody actually knows that. There's almost nobody who knows who Alexander, yeah, right? So, 
So the model that I grew up with was, you know, lonely scientists working away late at night and, and by candlelight and comes in, aha, you know, problem solved, right? I, I love what Sidney Brenner said about this where he said, you know, I, I've heard so many people who, um, who make these great discoveries when they go to lunch, you know, and they come back and there's something on their bench and they never expected it. So he said, said uh, I, I now go to lunch six times a day <laughs> because, because I discovered that's the best. So, and this works great for fundamental research. Uh, and I would argue we need to preserve that because it really does. For many applications, it really works. I mean, all my papers were first author, pa for two author papers, and there's a lot of situations where that's still important. It's not for translation, however. This is really science as golf. You know, it's a solitary exercise. Maybe you have a caddy, um, uh, but 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 fundamentally, it's it's you against the scientific problem. Th that's not translation. This is translation. You got to have many different people who have different expertise, and, and I'm going to show you a picture uh, in a little bit, which will really um, uh, exemplify this. But but now let me take you through uh, the football thing. Okay, so imagine now. Uh, here's the quarterback. He's the he's uh, uh, and he, what's what's going on here? The quarterback's handing off to the running back. The running back's going to try to run around here and score, right? But there's this uh, offensive line, uh, defensive lineman. He's the uh, the defense. He's going to try to take this guy out. Uh, so this guy, number 72, is going to throw his body in front of number. 13 uh, before uh, this guy makes hamburger of this guy, right? So that's the funny, now you know everything you need to know about football. Now, imagine this is academia. If this guy scores, the only people who are going to get credit for the score are the quarterback and the running back. That is otherwise known as the senior author and the first author. <laughs> now, number 72, who, without whom, this guy would be crumbled up in a heap and would never have scored is a middle author. So, number 72 does not get tenure. So, do you think in the, in, in the academic world, do you think we score very many goals in the translational space? No. Why? Because we have all the incentives completely wrong. If the only people who got Super Bowl rings were these two, what do you think the offensive line would do? They say, come on, I'm going to go out and get a job where I can get tenure. Right, so we have to change this, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that NCAS is going to be working on over the long term. Okay, so this, this is the standard model. You've been hearing about this lab to, to clinic, uh, but really how, how we want it to work is like this, and you've seen this before, and I animated this. Ooh, aren't you impressed that it, it can go around this way? Uh, uh, but, but the, oh, look at that, huh? All right, okay. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we're all about innovation. Okay, so that is the way it's supposed to work. Uh, and, and I do want to emphasize that, that NCATS, I mean, you all know this here, but I always have to say this, NCATS um, uh, goes uh, from you know, T1, you know, that is, uh, if you believe in this classification, to proof of concept in humans, to, to uh, uh, translation to, to, to patients in a, <coughs> excuse me, in a clinical trial, uh, to translation to practice, to, to, to public health. And I often spend some time uh, talking about that, but you know that and, you, and you've heard uh, talks about that, so I won't belabor the point. Just to, just to make the point that NCATS works across the spectrum. Why is this so important? If you think about the NCATS mission, tangibly improves human health, right? Where is human health? It's over here. So if all we do is down here, I would argue, we haven't succeeded, right? We just moved the bulge in the snake down a little bit, which is okay, but it, it's, it's, we haven't completed the job. Because uh, there are lots of examples, and I could regale you with them, but so you probably know some of them, where, where perfectly good interventions have gotten stuck at one part or another. Okay, so what are the programs and initiatives? I'm just gonna run through these really quickly, uh, give you a sense of what we do. The CTSA program, uh, a bunch of programs on rare diseases, uh, and then uh, a bunch of programs on re-engineering uh, translational sciences in a general way. So one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing uh, NCATS to do is to do everything that is done within the center uh, to have these, th this, this sort of mantra. That is that there are these three Ds. We, we not only wanna develop uh, novel paradigms, technologies, uh, 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 ways of doing things, which, which we think will improve one or more steps of the translational process, T1 to T4. Uh, but we have to demonstrate in individual use cases that they actually are better. Because if it's just hypothetical, nobody should believe us. But, but if we do demonstrate that they're better, we can't just assume that, that, that others will, will adopt them. In fact, we know this isn't the case. So there's a whole area of dissemination or implementation science, uh, which, 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 which we have to uh, um, focus on it, uh, very deliberately as well. Um, so uh, Division of Clinical Innovation. Um, 
this is the division uh, that Elaine Collier is the acting director of, who's uh, here with me today. Uh, and this is uh, a, sort of a, a vision, a uh, couple of uh, some, some uh, bullets about the vision. As I said, the three Ds of methods and technologies uh, to logarithmically improve the efficiency of translational clinical research. Uh, this problem, I would argue, is not one that we can simply have a 10% or 20% improvement in. If you think about the drug process, because it's probably the most uh, quantified, you know, a process which fails 99.9% .9 of the time and costs two to four billion dollars. If we have a 10% improvement, oh great, you know, only fails 99.7% of the time <laughs> and only costs, you know, 1.8 billion instead of two billion. I would argue that that's just not going to cut it. We're, we need to go from 99.9% .9 to 80%, you know, which is so 80% failure. I mean, even in the government, that'd be pretty good. Um, and uh, and but seriously, if, you know, that would be a huge improvement. Um, and, and I think we really have to have to have to aim for that logarithmic improvements. So if, so, and when you think about that, it really does change the kinds of things that you're willing to do. Um, that, that, that you have to do as, as a center. And, and part of this is, too, that the other institutes at NIH are really good at incrementalism. You know, they're doing a lot of this already, but, but, that's, so that, but that's not what, not what NCATS is for. Okay, uh, this is a big one uh, for me and, and probably for a lot of you. I talked to a lot of people about this resurrection, it's probably, I don't know if that's too strong a term, of, of, of the, the primacy of clinical investigation and phenotyping uh, in, in translation. You know, when, when I was in training, this is what we got trained to do very deeply study individual patients. And, and anybody who knows anything about the medical research process knows that many, many, many fundamental. Uh, uh, advances have come from that. But over the last 30 years, as you all know better than I do, uh, the, the pressures of reimbursement and uh, uh, academic departments having to make money, et cetera, has meant that this has become very difficult uh, for, uh, for younger folks uh, to do, uh, protected time, et cetera. So, uh, and the CTSA programs have, have contributed enormously to this, and this is one of the things, one of the, one of the driving forces, as you probably know, for Elias Sarhouni uh, starting this program in the first place. And, and so we're really focused on this in the IOM report, uh, if you've read that, talks about this a lot, uh, innovative training programs. Uh, over the long term, this is what really what EDCATS wants to do, and I mentioned this before, a robust discipline of ac uh, academic discipline of translational research with different characteristics that allows you to get tenure, uh, uh, not because you have a first author paper in cell, because a lot of what we're doing here isn't going to get you a first author paper in cell or any paper in cell, uh, but you could have a fundamental public health impact and, and not get uh, publications of those sorts. And, and so we needed a, a distinct uh, a distinct characteristics. And, and new models, of course, for engagement, collaboration, partnership, and you probably can't see this, but this is bolded. You know, we always talk about community engagement, and that's, imp I, I, I like to think about communities engagement, because of course there isn't just one community, there's many different communities. It depends on, on what the stage of the program is. Okay, so you know about the CTSA program because we are in one, uh, so I'll just skip through this. Uh, this is the new map, uh, and you will notice that there is a, a Moriola over here, uh, and, and that Moriola is New York, uh, and uh, which is, you know, you should feel proud of that. Um, and, uh, um, and, I, but, and there's a new member, so who knows who the new member is? Oh, there's a plant, yes. The, the new one is Dartmouth up there. Um, and so there's now uh, 62 centers. So, so uh, this is uh, Zerhuni's original uh, uh, slide. Um, and, and I'm going to let me actually just I'm going to run through this first, just to tell you the new. So, so there was some we, we made this announcement of the 15 uh, new awards. Uh, it came out October 22nd, even though it was supposed to come out October 1st. Um, I'll give you one guess why that didn't happen. Um, so we did put it out anyway. Uh, and one of those is you, yay! Um, so here's here's you guys, and congratulations to Harry and all of you who so I'm sure work night and day and burning the midnight oil to get this done. So congratulations. I'm glad to have you still with us. Uh, and here's Dartmouth, uh, who's the who's the new one. Um, so let me just go back and, and, and just tell, say some, a couple of things about the IOM report. So, so when uh, NCATS got formed, um, and, uh, in part of our authorization language said uh, that NIH will commission an IOM report to, uh, 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 um, uh, to really think about where the CTSA program should, do, should, should go in light of current clinical translational needs and in terms of the NCATS mission.
mission, which is different from the NCRR mission. And so uh, this uh, uh, report was commissioned in July, came out in June, uh, and, and you've probably all read it, so I'm just I'm not going to go this in any detail. It's on the web. Uh, but here's the seven recommendations, um, and, and I'm not going to belabor this, just to say where are we now. Um, so uh, as was recommended in the, in, in the IOM report, in fact, um, we have uh, uh, convened uh, a working group of our advisory council um, uh, to help implement the recommendations, and uh, we're finalizing the the um, uh, the members, I'd hope to be able to announce that today, but we just didn't get the final letters back from everybody, uh, so I can't do that. But it's a, it's a very it's a it's a group, very distinguished group of, of very broad recommendations uh, or expertise. And remember, this is a working group of the council, not a subcommittee of the council. So the difference is a subcommittee. Everybody is on the council. A working group, there's two representatives from the council and everybody else isn't on the council. And that's typically done because working groups like this, you don't have all the expertise that we need for, for this working group on the council itself. And it's a little NIH uh, 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 um, detail. Okay, so, so the main thing that we're charging them to do, and this again, this comes up over and over and over again in the IOM report, uh, is definition of clear, measurable goals and objectives uh, that address critical issues across the full spectrum of research uh, and, and have uh, outcomes and deliverables that allow uh, the program and allow all of us and the public who, uh, who fund this as the NIH's single biggest program, you probably know that, um, uh, 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 to, 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 to know whether it's being successful or not. So is it working on important problems and is it getting anywhere? Is it improving those, uh, the, the outcomes of those programs, problems? Okay. Um, so, in, in no particular order, uh, I'm sometimes asked, "Well, what are, you know? What are you talking about? You know, translational problems?" And, and these are these are some of the problems. It's really not a complete list, but if you think about the problems, the general problems that bedevil this space, this is at least some of them. And you've talked about a lot. Of, we've heard about a lot of them today. So you heard about from Chris. Uh, I had data interoperability, and I added governance here. Uh, that's Chris's word because I like that. Um, uh, clinical trial networks, electronic health records, IRB federation, patient recruitment, diagnostic criteria, outcome criteria, you just heard a lot about that, biomarker qualifications, adaptive clinical trial design, shorten the time of innovation adoption from 17 years to two weeks, uh, uh, methods to better measure impact on health, or lack thereof of, of, of an intervention. And, 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 and when you think, whenever I'm asked, you know, what do I mean by this, I always think about Premarin. You know, that's my favorite example. You know, postmenopausal estrogen was a perfectly rational intervention which passed every uh, a milestone, looked to work, but when the Women's Health Study looked at public health impact, it actually had the opposite effect. And, and so we, 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 we shouldn't be snookered by this. We should be looking for these things prospectively. Okay, so that's the CTSAs. Let me just say a couple things about the other parts of, 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 of NCATS. Um, so ORDR, a lot of you know of, um, the Office of Rare Diseases Research, uh, it does a lot of things. The biggest part that it does is this Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. It's actually 17 consortia, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, it, it operates uh, it, in, a, in a very different way from the CTSA program. Uh, in a really complementary way because its goals are different. Uh, but, but I think there's a lot of things that the, that the CTSA program can learn from the RDCRN and, and vice versa. Um, so I hope to bring the, these groups together uh, uh, more than they have been before. There's a lot of overlap, frankly, uh, in, in personnel between them. Uh, and and here's, here's the network. Uh, and, and a couple things I just want to want to bring to your attention. So first of all, there are Einstein people uh, in many of these. Uh, the one that I know uh, most about is this uh, nef the nephrotic syndrome one. Uh, but there are others, dystonia and others. Uh, but, but the other thing uh, is really interesting about this program is, is it required uh, in, it requires involvement, deep involvement of patient advocacy groups in every, in every consortium to be on the steering committee, governance committee, and you can't just study one disease. So, so we're not going if to, we, if we try to handle all 7,000 diseases one at a time, we're never going to get there. But these things are related to each other, right? So, so these are uh, organizations that study between 5 and 20 related diseases, uh, either related by pathogenesis or, or, uh, uh, or, or the, the, the biochemical pathways or uh, cellular uh, uh, cell type affected or organ affected, whatever it might be. 
Okay, so working backwards now, I've been talking mainly about down here. I'm going to move back. So there's a whole preclinical pipeline, uh, which, which is a, a bunch of complementary programs. Uh, and, and, and I'm just going to take you through a couple of examples here. Um, uh, this, the, 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 the operating principle of this program is that, uh, that there is a lot of fantastic science out there that is not going anywhere because the people who did that fantastic science are outside of their comfort zone in taking it forward. And so the idea is, if you, you, you keep them there, because that's what they know how to do, and they do that really well, but, but you team them up with people at NCATS who don't know anything about the disease, often can't even spell the disease, but they know a lot about drug development, about uh, at one stage of it or another. So, so what's meant is that these people, the, our collaborators, get stuck at, at one stage or another in this process, and then they go into one or more of these boxes here, which is a different program, and then out the bottom comes deliverables, and those deliverables are meant to be dual-use deliverables. They're, they have a deliverable that's useful to the collaborator to move their science forward. Um, uh, in sometimes their, their, their target validation, sort of fundamental uh, 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 pathogenesis sort of questions, or, uh, uh, and sometimes they're, they're frankly therapeutic. Uh, but the other is that, that, that each one of these should tell us uh, something about paradigm technology development, some, something to help us learn how to do the whole process better, to decrease that failure rate from 99.9 percent .9 to something less than that. Um, and, and so sometimes this is data, sometimes it's probes, sometimes it's, it's leads of some sort of repurposed drugs, et cetera. Okay, so every one of these, uh, uh, every project, so this organization, this part of NCATS has 300 active collaborations at the moment, and, and they're all over the country uh, and the world. Um, and, and so even though it is administratively, uh, it, it, it appears on the, uh, on the MEC tables at NIH as an intramural group, it's 90% it's, it, it, of the collaborators are extramural, and, and there's, we have, a, we're putting our money where our mouth is here, uh, there are no principal investigators, there's no Tenure. There's no tenure track. Everybody works in project teams, and every project is a collaboration with somebody somewhere in the world. So it is, it is, it is a sort of administratively intramural, but it acts as a as a collaborative instrument because we believe very strongly that's the way to make translational programs move forward. Okay, so this is the staff. Um, uh, this is where this expertise uh, tends to be. So in order to get hired, you have to tell me what is the state of the art at, at one stage or another, either with target validation, to assay development, high throughput screening, medicinal chemistry, cheminformatics, uh, toxicology, pharmacology, PK, BD, formulation, et cetera. Um, regulatory, but you also have to tell me how to do it better. Because if all we did is create what these places currently do, which fail 99.9% .9 of the time, that would be really dumb, right? We have an opportunity to do it better. And we could do it better because we don't have the short-term commercial imperative that all these places have. Right, so we can we can follow the science, and that is really really different. And we could talk about that later if you're if you're interested. Okay, so th this is uh, one part of the organization, the NCGC. You probably heard of. Uh, its focus is on target to lead, if you will. So, uh, and we focus on unprecedented targets, uh, rare neglected diseases. Um, in addition to the fact that you know, if you look at the universe of targets encoded by the human genome, the universe of diseases which affect the human family, 95 percent of targets and diseases are not worked on by anybody. So we don't have to look far, but that's what this organization works on. Uh, uh, and its, its mission is to produce chemical probes, siRNA probes, new technologies, paradigms, et cetera. And over the long term, and I don't really have time to talk about this because it's a different talk, but, but, but over the long term, what this organization is trying to do is decrease the empiricism of this part of the process um, by understanding the general principles by which small molecules and their targets interact and the general principles by which uh, siRNAs work. Uh, and, and I don't have time to get into that, but, but that's what all, where all we're going uh, eventually. Uh, and here's just one example, uh, and I, I chose a New York example because um, uh, we haven't been here. There's Barry Collar, a lot of you know, who's a, is a Rockefeller. Uh, this was a, a program to produce a, a, a platelet uh, integrin receptor antagonist, um, uh, uh, alpha 2b beta 3 receptor, which is an integrin platelet antagonist uh, uh, for thrombosis, um, and uh, got on the cover of Science Translational Medicine, among other things. Um, another thing that this organization has done, some of you probably know about, uh, was to uh, uh, address the this general problem of drug repurposing. Um, uh, so you all know about repurposing, finding new uses for old drugs. But, but when we started thinking about this about five years ago, it occurred to us that if we re what we really need to do is industrialize this and answer the really interesting question. If you look at those 6,750 diseases, 6,750 diseases, how many of them would be ameliorable to some degree or another by a drug in the current pharmacopoeia? 
That's a really interesting question. And if we knew the answer to that question, it'd be really important for two, for three reasons. One, it would have immediate public health impact. Two, it would tell us really profound things about systems pharmacology, about human, how the human organism is put together. And three, it would scope the remainder of the problem. So, you know, if those, of those 6,000 odd diseases, only 2% of them are treatable to some degree or another by a current drug, that means 98% of those diseases, we got to go through a new, uh, uh, a new chemical entity development, which is a much bigger problem, much more expensive, as opposed to 50%, it's a much smaller problem. So I went to our folks at the time and said, okay, I want a complete number redundant list of every drug ever approved for human use worldwide. Go away. And I thought I'm going to come back in two weeks. And I, well, it took them five years. <laughs> and there's, in case you're wondering why this is, or reads like a Tom Clancy novel, but they're, they're, it's done now. And all the information's on the web. The whole collection uh, is used all the time in collaborative screens. Um, but, this, but this is a classic NCAS thing. It was done pre-NCATS, of course, but it was uh, a, a classic NCAS enabling technology, which is across all diseases. Um, so uh, uh, I don't have time to go into uh, uh, applications of that. I thought I would just skip to a different um, uh, repurposing program, which, which approaches a slightly different problem. So, so the, 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 this, this collection is uh, mostly not completely, but it's mostly approved drugs, drugs that have been approved for some uh, other indication. There's a cognate problem, uh, which is drugs which never make it to approval for anything. And, and if you think about the, the, the reciprocal uh, of the 99.9% .9 problem, that is only 0.1% of drugs get approved, that means that, that for every drug that gets approved, there's 999 drugs that failed somewhere along the process, right? So they either fumbled on the 10-yard line or the 50-yard line or the 30-yard line or in the red zone or something, but it didn't get approved. So a lot of people have thought, well, gosh, you know, these are from a, a pharma uh, a perspective, uh, these somewhere between 10, 20, and 100, couple of hundred million dollars have frequently been, been uh, uh, um, invested in these assets, and they're non-performing assets from a business standpoint. So from a business perspective, these would be, if we could find uses for these, this would be monetizing non-performing assets, if you want to think of it from a business perspective. From a public health perspective, it, it, it would be perhaps a quick win, right? So you can run on the football field, you're starting at the four yard line and you and, and and if you have a new play you might be able to to to, to run it in um, and even the redskins might be able to do that on a good day um, uh, but but the question was would this work um, so the first problem was if we went to pharmas would they give us the information and the compounds and and somewhat to my surprise because I never thought I would see this in my lifetime having spent many years in that environment uh, they did and there were actually eight different companies who came forward with 58 different compounds uh, that uh, as you can see here failed uh, at very late stage due to lack of efficacy or for business reasons but every one of these has been into people already and been shown to safe uh, safe just not effective and then they get or they got deprioritized for business reasons. Uh, and NIH uh, uh, then provided a template uh, uh, collaborative agreements with each of the pharmas, uh, and, uh, and the pharmas provided compounds or the biologics and kind support, pertinent data, regulatory support, all that stuff. Uh, and, and then we went to the academic researchers, and we said, well, you know, here's the compounds, here's their mechanism of action, here's what they've been tested for before, give us your best ideas. And, and frankly, we didn't know whether they would just be the same old, same old ideas, or whether there would really be a rich, uh, new uh, uh, group of ideas. We were overwhelmed by this process, I must say. It, it happened far faster and far better than I ever anticipated. The first thing is these these uh, these template agreements, um, the collaborations between the academic investigators and the pharma's. Uh, they had 11 weeks to get these things done. If you've ever done a collaborative agreement with a pharma, you know that most tech transfer offices take uh, what an order of magnitude longer than that. So they had 11 weeks, got done. Uh, the second thing is crowdsourcing these indications. I don't have time to show you the data, but we got uh, uh, applications for all but one of these drugs, and in many cases, we had five or six different indications different from each other and different from what the pharma had ever thought about for one drug. And, and so this, this really uh, uh, gives us evidence, again, that the wisdom of the crowd uh, is, is, really, is really important. Um, and, and so the academics brought deep understanding of disease biology, new concepts, uh, and access to patients, of course. And so these are the dr these are the the um, uh, the, um, uh, the companies, uh, and 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 this these uh, awards were were issued in June. There's nine of them, and these are the disease areas. And, and what's interesting about this list is that it is really, uh, uh, for the most part, a rogues gallery of 
poorly or untreatable diseases, which was really gratifying to us. Uh, some of them common, uh, like alcoholism or Alzheimer's. Some of them uncommon, like Duchenne's or, or lymphangiomyomatosis. Um, uh, two for schizophrenia, interestingly, um, which um, uh, was just the luck of the draw, the luck of the peer review process. And, and so these are now uh, either in late stage preclinical, because in some cases that some animal studies uh, were required, uh, but in most of the cases they're in people uh, even already. And so how are we going to know whether this is successful? I mean, currently, I mean, we certainly, I'm, we're interested whether these studies result in new indications or approvals that, that treat untreatable diseases, of course. but. Remember, NCATS is all about new methods, technologies to speed up, improve, make more efficient the translational process. So what we're interested in is, did the use of the template agreements speed negotiation time, right? So, so working, an academic and a pharma working together, this is not new to this program. The fact that it happens so fast, that is new. Does crowdsourcing of indications generate new ideas better than the one-off, uh, as, as Abel was talking about, you know, the conventional model, which is you meet somebody in a bar, you start talking about something, oh yeah, you wanna do that? Yeah, sure. You know, there's a better way, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, 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 generate new ideas. Okay, so uh, you, this was fantastically successful program. Your obvious question is, are we going to do it again? Uh, I will refer you to uh, the most recent um, uh, article on sequester for the answer to that question. So uh, we are trying, but it's, it, there's no money uh, to do it, which is just, it drives me insane, but there we are. Okay, so trend, a different program. Um, uh, so same model as the NCGC I sh showed you before, um, uh, collaboration between uh, uh, formerly intramural labs with preclinical drug development experience from pharma biotech with extramural labs or external labs uh, that have disease area target expertise. And the point here is that these programs uh, start where the NCGC ends. So NCGC goes from a target, interesting observation, gene, et cetera, to a lead or a pharmacological probe. This program starts where the NCGC stops, so from a, a, a lead to a, a proof of concept in humans. Uh, and the goal is to take it just as far as they have to go to be uh, a licensable to an organization, usually a company, but not always, uh, uh, to take it through the rest of clinical development, licensing, marketing, all that stuff. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through a few highlights here. There are 15 projects in the program so far. There's four investigational drugs that were taken into humans actually in the course of about 18 months, uh, natural history studies. Each one of these is a, is a unique collaboration, either public-private or private-private. I'm just going to uh, talk about one. This is one that I talk about all the time, but I, I particularly talk about it uh, due to this uh, gentleman in the front row uh, who has been a... Uh, it's hard when I talk about Steve. You know, Steve is one of the most wonderful collaborators I have ever had the privilege of having in my career, and you are so fortunate to have him here. Um, and 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 he is he really exemplifies why this project has has worked so well. So so what is this project? It's a project on nematic C, which is a, a very rare uh, lysosomal storage disease. Uh, gene was cloned um, about what 15 years ago. Uh, it's a, a, a lysosomal uh, transporter um, uh, defect. Um, uh, uh, the drug is a really weird drug. Uh, it's, it's actually cyclodextrin, which some of you may know is an excipient to make non-soluble drugs soluble so you can give them IV. That's what it's been used for. It's actually approved for that indication. Um, and, and there was some, uh, indica some, some evidence that I don't have time to go into, a lot of which uh, in animals generated in Steve's lab uh, and, and in vitro in our lab by, by screening of the drug collection I told you about, uh, that led us to believe that this might be effective in, in, in neonatic C. But, but then the question is, how to get this crazy drug, which had been used as a drug, to kids who have a brain disease. So this drug is intrathecal cyclodextrin. And if you look at the collaborators here, there's collaborators from NIH, from WashU, does biochemistry, from Albert Einstein, Steve, uh, UPenn, Charles Veet, uh, who does uh, cat animal models, and J&J, &J, who makes the drugs. And, and the NPC foundations have been very involved in facilitating, uh, mostly facilitating, uh, most of the, the whole time. And we've gone through all of these milestones. It's now an approved concept clinical trial. And, and the point I want to make about this is this, this, this picture. So this is a picture that we took, uh, and, and, and you'll notice uh, uh, this individual here. Um, this is a picture that we took uh, after a meeting with the FDA. It was a pre-IND meeting that we had a couple years ago. And the point I want to make is if you go back to the football team, this is a little big for a football team, but you don't, like any football team, you don't have all the players on the field at the same time, right? But you look at these, there's 20 members of this team, and they have expertise spanning genetics, biochemistry, cell biology, animal models, pharmacology, drug development, regulatory, neurology, and neurosurgery. No matter how smart you are, you cannot be expert in all of these things. You cannot play all of these positions. And there's nine different organizations. But all of these organizations, all these people came together to solve these problems for the terribly sick kids who have this disorder. And, and, and it looks like we may actually have some success. 
Okay, so last thing I'm going to tell you about is to, to give you an idea of the, the kind of technology development things that we're doing, and there's many other things that we're doing, I just don't have time to go into them all, uh, but, but, but here's, here's something that sort of exemplifies what, what, uh, what uh, what, what NCATS is doing. So, so the problem here is the, uh, the, in the failure of um, uh, new therapeutics for toxicity reasons. So you probably know that the three big reasons that uh, therapeutics fail in preclinical development are uh, unanticipated tox that wasn't seen in animal models, toxicity, unanticipated lack of efficacy, where efficacy was seen in animal models, or business reasons. Um, and so those are the three things that NCAS is working on, uh, so it's tox efficacy and de-risking. Um, so here's a program focused on the tox problem primarily, maybe on the efficacy problem if we're lucky here. So the goal here is to develop a human-based system by which one can test potential therapeutics uh, and eventually get rid of uh, animal testing completely, um, not, not for you know, uh, ethical or, 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 or you know, animal rights reasons, simply because animal models are, are not human and they're not predictive as, as much as they should be. So the, so the question was, you know, could we develop um, uh, using a combination of IPS, e tissue printing, um, uh, 3D uh, tissue model, organoid technologies, uh, biosensor technologies, and microfluidics uh, and engineering, um, could we create a human on a chip, essentially, where we have a little organoid representing each uh, tissue, each of the major tissues connected by microfluidic channels carrying uh, artificial blood, infuse a potential therapeutic uh, and have it, say, absorbed by uh, a, a, an organoid intestine and then, and then go to an organoid liver and get metabolized and then go to an organoid kidney and, uh, and cause uh, glomerulosclerosis or something. Uh, that's, that's the concept. Uh, pretty wild, but I will I will tell you that I have been proven wrong again. <laughs> it's a theme in this program, this uh, talk, by this program because this program is actually ahead of its milestones, which is a real surprise to me. But I think it's a, it's a con it's a, it's due to the conversion of all those technologies I just talked about. So it's it's a it's a it's an NCATS a typical NCATS program because it focuses on an important, well-known problem, general problem in the translational space. It is uh, a it is a log it would be a logarithmic transformational change. This is not uh, you know doing you know a few less animals. This is fundamental change uh, in in the way we do this kind of treatment, and it's collaborative. So this is a collaboration between us and DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and the FDA. Uh, the money is coming from NIH and DARPA. Um, uh, the, the, and basically what happens is DARPA does the, the, does the engineering, microfluidics, and, and NCATS does all the biology, and then FDA uh, is there to provide regulatory guidance because the, the whole goal here is, is to have this be useful for regulatory approvals. Uh, and they got funded about a year and a half ago now. Uh, and I'll just, just give you two examples. So this is a lung chip that you probably heard about from the, uh, from the Visa Institute up in Boston, um, uh, which represents um, uh, uh, capillary alveolar uh, interfaces, and this is a blood brain barrier uh, chip. Uh, Importantly, um, these are these are being built as modules, uh, so like the Lego bricks, as was talked about before. So you can mix and match these in whatever way you want. So if you want a, you know, a brain and a liver in one case, or a kidney and skin in another, you know, you can you can mix and match these in any way you want. Um, the, the current state of the program is that, that all of the programs met their one-year milestones. They're all done as cooperative agreements. They all have go-no-go -go decisions and, uh, uh, and, and mild, very strict milestones, um, and, uh, but they were all renewed for year two. Um, interestingly, what's going on now is that the individual teams, the NIH teams, there's about 18, 19 of them working on different organs, and they're beginning to work together uh, to, to put, their, put their modules together, and that's actually ahead of schedule. Uh, something which is uh, perhaps not unexpected, in fact, in not unexpected, but a little uh, sobering to somebody like me who spent most of his laboratory career working in monolayer cells. Um, is that uh, we've in repeatedly demonstrated really key differences uh, between both uh, monolayers and uh, organoids, three-dimensional multicellular aggregates, uh, and between static cultures, you know, one time and dynamic cultures, because these are meant to go on for about a month at a time. Um, so what is this problem doing? It's addressing major NCATS uh, initiatives, this translational bottleneck problem, recapitulating you know, human physiology, certainly reducing animal models, uh, three R's of animals, 
and, and we think also it's going to improve the reproducibility problem. Um, one of the things that's going into every stage of this program is standardization, uh, comparison to uh, among the uh, investigators, uh, and validation across platforms, uh, validation using uh, 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 positive and negative controls, et cetera, um, uh, in, in a very rigorous way. Okay, so uh, just a f uh, the, the, the last slide here, take home messages. I started with this, uh, the opportunities and the needs uh, in translational science are absolutely huge. And, and uh, those of you who are, who are, who are docs, I don't, need you, I don't need to tell you what the needs are. You see them in the clinic every day. Um, they're, they're huge, they're systematic, and, and, and I would argue are, are, are ours to solve now. Um, uh, and, but they require systematic solutions. We can't use the previous way uh, to do things. And you heard Chris talking about this before uh, in, in informatics. The scale of the opportunities uh, requires transformational change. Um, this, is not ch this is not moving around the edges. This is logarithmic improvements. And that we can't do 21st century science with the 20th century structure of science. And, and we've just begun, NCAS has just begun to transform itself uh, and, and transform its programs uh, to meet these uh, opportunities and needs for the benefit of patients. Because uh, whenever, whenever we get together as a group, I always tell people, if you ever have trouble thinking about what you want to do for your program, think about if you were a patient of this disease, what would you want? And the answer has actually become pretty clear. Uh, so if you have questions about any of these uh, programs, I want to leave, you're going to have these slides. Uh, you know Elaine, uh, who's as the CTSA, but any of these other programs I talked about, uh, these are all the people, uh, and um, uh, you know where to find this on the web. Thank you.